Um, our final speaker then to, uh, this evening is James Elliott from the Department for Communities. And James is head of access of the food team, which was set up during the COVID pandemic uh, to lead on the department's energy food response. And James will be speaking about the, the pilot social supermarkets as a model for addressing food poverty. Thanks, James. All right. Um, thanks very much for inviting me here to speak today. Um, as has been said, I'm the head of the access to food team, in the Department for Communities, which is um, a, you know, a new team set up during COVID. Um, before that, the only sort of specific action the department was taking on food was um, a pilot social supermarket program. Um, so we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, today, as you know, I'm primarily going to talk to you about the social supermarkets, but I will touch upon the COVID response and how that shaped some of our thinking with regards to the current work of social supermarkets and the impact of the cost of living crisis. Um, Instead of focusing on social supermarkets, but I think it's important to recognise the context in which they were launched um, and the period during which the in-depth evaluation was conducted, as obviously we're in very different times now. Um, work initially began in response to the recommendations in the Welfare Reform Mitigations Report that action should be taken to improve access to affordable food through a network of community shops and social stores or supermarkets. Um, and noted the rise in food bank usage as we expected to get worse as a result of welfare reform and stated that the department should explore alternative models. As a result, an independent feasibility study was carried out for the department, mapping what activity was already taking place across the country and they assess options to launch a new model, um, which subsequently ended in the recommendation that the department take forward a pilot program with a small number of sites. Um, broadly speaking, the model would use what the suggestion was the model would start utilize surplus food stock to provide people with access to food alongside the provision of wraparound services. There was a view at the time this would be a service targeting those who were in danger of needing to go to a food bank, but not necessarily at the crisis point, or those who had been to a food bank were past that initial crisis and wished to continue to access food alongside um, wraparound services. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, so following those recommendations, we got the approvals we needed to run a social supermarket pilot program and this launched in October 17. Um, the aim of a social supermarket model is to offer a more sustainable response to food poverty by seeking to address the issues that are the cause of an individual's food poverty or insecurity rather than simply provide food. So this is done through the provision of tailored wraparound support, which has included debt and benefits advice, budgeting, healthy eating advice, alongside training volunteering opportunities to enhance future employability skills. There really is no limit to what can be included as part of that wraparound. It's about the ANC organization partnering with other organizations and utilizing existing supports and services. So five sites have been running um, since October 17 and support around 300 people between them at any one time. All five that were selected are well-established organizations with strong links to their local communities. They already ran various interventions to tackle poverty and had a strong referral networks for their services, including advice services, GPs, and social services. All were delivering some form of food-based initiative, such as food banks, health eating courses, or community cafes. And it's worth noting that the four organizations that ran food banks at the outset continue to do so. Um, alongside their social supermarket, which demonstrates the models perhaps addressing different needs. All five operate slightly differently, and this reflects the pre-existing organization ethos of the organizations, their capacity, and the networks they already had. And whilst there, effects, there was flexibility for them each to develop their own model, there was a set of core characteristics that were agreed on with the department at the outset. So we move on to the next slide. So there must be an assessment of need and access criteria applied to ensure the service is delivered to those most in need. And there is also concern, certainly um, by some in the department, there may be seen as competition to local retailers if access was unlimited. In the event, this has never been raised and indeed many local retailers have become involved in supporting the projects. The second part was a tailored wraparound plan should be implemented for each individual user accessing the service. So this is based on an initial entry interview with individuals identifying areas that could benefit them in the long term if they were addressed. 
Um, the uptake of that wraparound is a condition of access and food support. I know there are people that dislike the model um, because of this element. The idea you would withhold food from someone in need. However, each organization works with the individuals to help them engage and attempt to refer those who don't, won't or can't um, onto the appropriate services, even if that is on the food bank to meet that immediate need. It was also agreed there must be a financial transaction to access the support. And again, another element some weren't too keen on at the outset, um, but we felt this, um, this would help buy into the process rather than just receiving a handout. And feedback from the initial pilot period was positive overall, both from organizations and users. The financial transaction has tended to take the form of a membership fee. It is relatively low, on average it's five pounds a week with some organizations scaling this according to household size. Part of the reason for a membership fee has been the fact the bulk of the stock in most instances is provided by Fair Share, who the department funded to supply the pilots. And for anyone not aware, they are a food redistribution charity who receive surplus food from major supermarkets and other local suppliers and producer, producers. And given that, it can't be resold. At each pilot, the food supply has also been bolstered with local donations and relationships with local shops and suppliers. Um, I suppose the other, just to say, the other reason for engaging fair share was to also they could bring in the supply of um, fresh fruit and veg and chilled meats. And they're supposed to move it on a bit from the, the traditional food bank offering. The final stipulation was the support must be for a time and a limited period to help prevent create dependency. And the rule of thumb at the outset of the program was this shouldn't be for more than six months. However, after a period of time, we allowed the organizations running the pilots to use their own judgment and recognition there was no point in exiting people if they were going to end up back at straight, square one straight away. And so we'll move on to the next slide. <coughs> Um, so by way of example, here's a couple of photos of the social supermarket in Stradam, which they have branded as grassroots, and all the organizations have branded their own. Stradam are one of the organizations who are running a food bank, which they felt was offering no long-term answer with them seeing the same people regularly. And the food bank was down a side street as people didn't want to be seen using it. Their hope for the social supermarket was to empower people and get them in the position they didn't need their services. They wanted to be, to be more dignified and so wanted the physical presence to look more mainstream and located at a more prominent position in the town centre. The social supermarket element, as with most of the pilots, looks more like a shop when they decided to have the social enterprise cafe linked to it. This not only provided some income generation, but also volunteering and op employment opportunities for social supermarket members. One of the pilots who didn't have space to open a facility like this developed an online ordering system, which they used as an opportunity to encourage people to shop in a nutritionally, nutritionally balanced way and link product pages to healthy recipes, and also used the opportunity to build people's IT skills if they needed it. And there has been a private sector involvement across the pilots, from volunteering time, donations, providing shelving for the fit out of the shop element, through to running application workshops for members when they have vacancies. We'll move on to the next slide then. Um, so as this was a pilot program, we engaged Strategic Investment Board at the outset um, to, to help us with the evaluation. And that has been completed up to March, 2020 when the pilot period formally concluded. The evaluation was based on both months, monthly stats gathered by the pilots detailing num um, numbers and members for distributed and wraparound services accessed alongside data from entry and exit questionnaires completed with each member, which tracked the impact of the service on them. So you can see some of the headline figures there. There were 1,100 members signed up to the social supermarkets during the pilot and 148 tons of food surplus that would have otherwise gone to waste and diverted to the pilots and redistributed on the members. The amount of funding the department has put in is not huge. Um, it's around 60k a year and in most cases that funding is used for staff costs to run the food store element and engage with members um, and coordinate the wraparound side of things. It's not in most cases paying for the delivery of the wraparound with services funded through other projects within the organization or through partnering and referring to third parties. In the region of 40 external partners are involved in the delivery of the wraparound up to five. And this also includes Bryson Energy, who the department contracted to provide fuel poverty support 
and the departments make the call team who carry out benefits checks to ensure members are accessing all the benefits they're entitled to. They were keen to be as invol involved as they felt many of those accessing the social supermarkets would be their own, their own target demographic who may maybe weren't coming forward um, and making the call with, you know, without that sort of direct engagement. Um, and that involvement has led to a number of large backdated assessments being made. Um, the most access type of wraparounds has been health eating, benefits advice, family budgeting, fuel poverty support, training employability skills and debt counselling. Um, to give you an idea of the profile of the members, although arising from the welfare reform mitigations, the department did not insist those accessing had to be in receipt of benefits. Rather, they had to be, have a very low disposable income. However, in the event, it has turned out that 97% of members or individuals in their household are in receipt of at least one social welfare benefit. As reflected by some of the other presentations, um, the majority were from lone parent households, the next largest being people who live alone. The majority have been unemployed, um, around 62% of the further 17% economically inactive. Um, mapping of member postcodes against spatial deprivation indicates a significant proportion, but not a majority, of members lived in locations that are amongst the most deprived in Northern Ireland. Um, it varied across the five in the exact percentage, but the evaluators concluded that, um, in their opinion, the access criteria and application of them was more important than the physical location of the social supermarket. And there is anecdotal evidence that people may be more likely to access this, access this sort of service outside of their immediate area, where they're less likely to know staff and other users. Whilst we don't have stats on why people came to the social supermarkets, we do know through the experience of the pilot and speaking to others working in this area, that whilst everyone seeking help cannot afford, cannot afford sufficient food at that point in time, their financial position is heavily influenced by a raft of issues such as ill health, relationship breakdowns, addiction, or mental health issues. So the next slide. In terms of outcomes, over the, overall the evaluation showed outcomes, positive outcomes for users in improving their financial security, their well-being and confidence. And on the slide there, you can see some of the headline figures. Um, I'll, not, I'll not read down them all, but I'll always take them with one the bottom one. At the entry stage, 61% cut um, indicated they were in the lowest five rankings in terms of life satisfaction. The corresponding percentage amongst the population of exits was only 9%. It's fair to say the outcomes are much wider than being than anything to do with welfare reform or just the uh, Department for Communities outcomes. And you can see the healthy eating aspect coming through. One thing that was noticeable was an indicators around awareness of healthy eating habits. Base was much higher than the practice, indicating perhaps people couldn't or didn't know how to implement them in their budget. On the next slide, please. Um, so this is just really in terms of the model itself. You can see there some of positive feedback in terms of affordability and dignity. Um, the level of volunteering suggests that members of the local community volunteered with the organization felt it was a worthwhile project. And there's also been good levels of volunteering amongst members and former members also. Um, so overall, the evaluation was very positive. And on that basis, the recommendation was made the department should work to rule the model out. However, before, before that work could commence, um, the COVID pandemic hit and all efforts were diverted to the emergency response. So we'll go on to the next slide there. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this um, long. Um, you'll see there the long list of uh, of initiatives there was during COVID, I suppose maybe a couple of key things just to pull out of it. In those first few months, um, there was 10 million allocated um, to deliver a food box scheme to those who were shielding and instructed to stay at home. And that mirrored the actions in the rest of the UK. However, the decision was taken here to extend the offer to those who were struggling to access food for any reason, um, including financial. And in the end, the majority of those in their seat weren't, weren't shielding. Um, so you can see the, the levels um, of funding that was put in there. And as lockdown eased and things began um, to settle down, we, we exited from the food boxes and, and started working with local councils and their volunteering community sector to try and 
try and exit and move away from that emergency response. Um, we did receive a small amount of money um, in, in the following year as well, 21, 22, and in that we continued working with fair share in the councils. And I suppose everything we did from, from the point of the food boxes onwards was about bolstering um, and enhancing the, the support that already, um, already existed there in the ground. Um, so throughout the period, this period, the pilots continued to operate, albeit with adaptive models, to take into account the social restrictions with deliveries of food being made in many cases and much of the wraparound delivered online. So you can move on to the next slide there. And just around, I suppose, what our thinking is now and what we're working on now and hope to be in the future. Um, COVID showed us a couple of things. Firstly, it was the sheer scale of those who came forward seeking assistance with food. At a time when the department put in place all of those additional supports, demand for Trussell Trust food bank services still rose to record levels. It shows potentially the scale of the population and in pre-COVID pre -COVID times, we're just getting by and no more. It also showed us, as, as in the department, the local councils and their voluntary and community partners understand and know what the need is in their areas better than the department ever could hope to. And without them, we wouldn't have been able to deliver an effective COVID response. This led to the proposal which the Minister supported that we would continue to work with the councils to roll out the social supermarket models, allowing them and their local stakeholders to design a model that would work best for their area. Um, the co-design is being informed both by ourselves and council officials alongside reps from the local voluntary and community sector, including those who already provide some form of food support and others such as advice services who are key to the wraparound element. Other statutory partners are involved, such as health trusts and regional colleges. Whilst the budget is not huge, it is hoped by providing that access to food alongside better network and, and better pathways between services and more sustainable response can be provided. Um, this work commenced in late 2021 and is ongoing in each council area. And this year it's been supported by funding of one and a half million, which continues to come from the welfare reform budget. From the department's perspective, it's about taking the learning both from the pilots and COVID to try and put in place models that deal with the immediate need, as well as addressing those underlying issues. I mean, entering into the co-design, the department's been clear that we don't have to be bound by how the pilots have operated. Um, this is one model of a social supermarket and DFC don't own the concept. Our red line really is that the, the projects emerging from this simply should, should not simply provide food and the dignity of the users is taken into consideration. In terms of the other characteristics I spoke about earlier for the pilots, um, we're open to other ideas and local people and organizations putting in place their own bespoke model. In terms of the existing pilots, they're being extended to the end of this financial year. And we do it, it's the intention that we work whilst we work with, we, we still take forward the co-design work with the four councils who have already have those pilots. And there's obviously a different dynamic there as they aren't starting with a clean sheet, but we're keen all councils lead in the programme in the future. Um, both through the co-design phase and the subsequent delivery phase, the department will seek to link other services funded both by the department and wider government in the delivery of any wraparound support. This will include advice and employability support, other supports funded from other strands of welfare reform. Um, to say the co-design is progressing in all areas as we speak. Um, some of the things impacting on how it's been approached or the likely results is the existing voluntary and community sector infrastructure in the area and the strength of pre-existing networks and the rural-urban split is, 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 a, is a big issue in, in a number of the councils. Um, major challenges are how to make the service accessible across a council area and assist the, the numbers that may come forward whilst ensuring the wraparound remains meaningful. Um, implementation will neither be uniform in terms of the model or the time scale. As I said, the intent is that the models come through a co-design process, so they will, for that reason, all be different. I'm already seeing um, some different approaches um, across the 11. Um, they're all, for many different reasons, they're all at different stages in the process. But um, on a positive note, the first council at the end of a pilot to launch their, their social is um, Expected to launch a social supermarket in the next few weeks. 
Um, as I already mentioned, DFC don't do social support concept. I'm aware there are already other examples of them operating in Northern Ireland with no DFC intervention. And from our perspective, that's great to see. We're also aware that Trust of Trust through its Pathfinder program and some other food banks are linking their users into these additional wraparound supports already. And so just on to the, the final slide there. Um, and back, I suppose, to the overarching theme of today. Um, as I mentioned, COVID delayed the rollout process, and unfortunately, it hasn't taken long for the next crisis to hit us. Um, the cost of living crisis is a massive challenge from any perspective. Um, social services, from our perspective, at least, were not, obviously not designed as a response to it. But in terms of issues with food, the model can't be the sole response to it, given the limits it has in terms of numbers served and geographical reach. Um, Trussell Trust statistics for 21-22 showed 36% increase from 1920, the last pre-COVID year, which was the largest increase in any of the UK nations. But given the scale of recent price rises, it's anticipated the next set of stats will, will be even worse. Um, the Consumer Council Household Expenditure Tracker to June 22 showed the 25% lowest earning households in Northern, Northern Ireland had an average only £29 per week disposable income left. It obviously wouldn't take much to tip those people into crisis if they aren't already there. And what we're hearing from our engagements is that um, community food providers are facing increased demand in the time of reducing stock. Um, that's reflected by the existing social supermarkets. The report's increasingly challenging to get people onto a sustainable financial footing as there are only so far budgets can be made to stretch. And as the minister mentioned earlier, you know, the whole voluntary sector as a whole and their staff are coming under pressure and the organisations are, are struggling um, with price rises themselves. Um, so I know that's a, a very bleak note to, to maybe leave you on. Um, and again, as the minister mentioned, without an executive, there is no additional money for any sort of emergency type response, which may be more appropriate in, in the times we're seeing. But hopefully whatever schemes Westminster put in place can be delivered here and ease some of the pressure. Um, so you know the minister is obviously aware of the issues being faced and the options are being prepared should money become available. Um, we'll be continuing with the social supermarket rollout, um, which we hope will provide a longer term and more strategic response um, to food poverty um, and will hopefully help some in the short to medium term. Um, there is a report card for the, the social supermarkets up to, to March 2020. And, I'm happy to share that with the organizers today and it can be passed on to anyone who's interested in that. So thanks very much for your time.